Hello, welcome to Concept Two Notes. We're going to be talking about adenosine triphosphate. And if you've never heard of adenosine triphosphate, get excited because it's going to about to become the most important molecule you've ever heard about. So what is it? We abbreviate it as ATP. And here's a little background that might help you. So remember, this unit is all about the flow of energy. We're talking how does energy get all the way from the sun down into your cells for you to use? Because your body needs energy to run your cells. And here's the thing. Your body cannot directly use your food for energy. So I don't know if you had a bowl of cinnamon toast crunch this morning, a bagel, or you're just drinking Dunkin' Donuts coffee right now. But your body cannot directly use the energy that's in those things as is. The energy you can use in the food you eat is stored in its chemical bonds. And so what your body needs to do is it needs to convert that energy in those bonds into a form that it can directly use. And so what we're going to need to do is break those bonds and make new bonds that store the energy in a way that it can be more directly used. Once that energy gets converted into more usable form, ATP is what's carrying it within its bonds to be used for cell functions. So in summary, if you think of ATP, I want you just to think of it that way, as an energy carrying molecule that's carrying or storing energy for cell functions within its bonds. Another way to think of it is it's the main energy currency for the cell. So it's the main thing your cell is going to access when it wants energy. It's not the only thing. Think about it this way. Um, I know for me, um, my main energy currency is cash. Okay, so if I need if I need money, if I need that, I'm going to cash. I'm not going to go get a check or you know have someone like snail mail me some money. Okay, my main currency is cash. Think of this as like cash money for the cell, basically. So let's talk about its structure because that's really important because remember, energy is stored in chemical bonds. So it has three main parts. It has this nitrogen base called adenine or adenine, some people will say. It has a sugar ring known as ribose. That's right here. And then it has three phosphate groups, one, two, three. And these are held together by some high energy bonds. Okay, so what's important to know is this is a not very stable molecule. Um, because of that, it doesn't take a lot of energy to break this bond right here between the second and third phosphates. Um, it doesn't require a lot of energy at all. So we really say if we want to access... Um, some energy here, we're going to want to break this bond right here and go from adenosine triphosphate with three phosphates to adenosine diphosphate with only two. Okay, so here's how it works. Remember, we learned from concept one, anytime a bond is formed, energy gets released. Anytime a bond is broken, energy is being absorbed, um, which is a, could be a little confusing. But remember, we're also looking at the overall picture here because all chemical reactions require bonds to be broken and formed. So we're looking big picture here. So I'm going to try to summarize it as simply as I can. So like I said, there's a lot of energy stored in this bond right here between the last two phosphates, and it's very unstable. So it actually it actually wants to be ripped off, if you will, um, there. And when we remove that phosphate group, we have to input energy to break the bond, but not a lot. That um, so that phosphate gets removed and it gets it's going to get added to another molecule and when it does a lot of energy is released. So think of ripping that off, adding it on to something else. A ton of energy gets released. Now we have ADP. We have just have two diphosphates. If we want to go back to ATP, we're going to have to add that phosphate group back on. So that ADP is going to be recycled. Okay, so we have ATP here, three phosphates. I rip off that phosphate. Energy is going to be released when that phosphate adds on to another molecule, and it's going to be used for cell processes. Now I have ADP. If I want to add that phosphate back on, it's going to um, energy is going to have to be absorbed to do that, um, um, and it's added from the food that is broken down. So from the food that you're eating, we're going to get that energy for that. And again, this is a little bit confusing. Um, 
because we talk about the overall reaction of ripping off this phosphate and releasing energy as an exothermic reaction is true. But remember, we're having to input a little bit of energy to break off that phosphate. And that the majority of that energy that's being released is happening when that phosphate is added onto another molecule. All right, so let's summarize this. Let's try to keep it simple. Overall, big picture, when ATP is broken down, when I rip off that phosphate, there's a release of energy for the cell to use, and it becomes ADP and then a phosphate group, a free phosphate that's attaching to something else. So if we were going to write our reaction, we'd have ATP, it's going to become ADP plus a free phosphate plus energy for the cell to use. Because more energy is going to be given off than is required to get this reaction going, because remember, this is ATP super unstable, so it doesn't take that much energy to break this bond. The overall reaction is exothermic. Now, to make more ATP, cells are going to join together ADP and a phosphate using energy from the food that they ate. So it's really hard. It takes a lot of energy to do this because, again, ATP is unstable. Um, ADP is more stable. So we're going to have to add in some energy here to make ATP. So because we're going to add in more energy than, the, than is going to be released from forming the ATP bond, the overall reaction is considered to be endothermic. And we make ATP in this way during cellular respiration. So in concept five, we're going to be talking about making ATP so that the cell can use it. And this is what we're talking about. Again, I want you to think of the food you eat as a check. When your grandma writes you a check for your birthday, maybe, or for your graduation or whatever, it's valuable. Like you want that money, but you can't just walk in a store per se and use that check to get something. What's more valuable is when you take that check and you put it in the bank and you get some cash. Okay, that's more directly usable. That's all we're talking about here with ATP. We're taking the food you eat, think of it like a check, and we're getting cash in the form of ATP for the cell. So again, where is this energy coming from then to, to get ATP, which is energy in a usable form? It's coming from the carbon-based molecules in our food. Remember macromolecules from unit one? I told you they were so important and they were gonna come up in every unit. Here they are. Remember we have carbohydrates. We talked about them as easy access energy, short-term energy. These are what your body's gonna most commonly break down to create ATP. About one glucose molecule can get us around 36 ATP if it's perfectly efficient. And remember, if we're looking at it in terms of um, calories of energy per gram, there's about four calories of energy per gram in a carbohydrate. Another place we get um, energy from to store as ATP is from lipids or the fats that you eat. Um, usually, we're gonna, our bodies are going to break those down after carbs. Um, lipids store nine calories per gram. So they, they're packing more energy per gram in than carbs, but they're not necessarily our first go-to source. Proteins can also be broken down for energy, but remember, they're our last resort. Proteins, we do a ton of other things with them, but they also store the same amount of energy as carbohydrates do. So this is what we're breaking down in our food in order to get the energy to form ATP. Um, these are the checks, if you will, that we're going to take to the bank and deposit to get cash as ATP. All right, hope that helps.